light up some bonfires. Except for the whole human sacrifice. Sacrifice. Part. <laughs> yeah. Well, there there are arguably a few people I wouldn't mind sacrificing. <laughs> like, here's the thing. <laughs> Based on where we're at in 2020, I mean, maybe we need a little human sacrifice. (laughs) I'm Paige. And I'm Megan. And this is Spooky Science Sisters. Hello, I'm Megan. And I'm Paige. And you're listening to Spooky Science Sisters, a podcast where we present to you a science-based and probably very giggly discussion on all things strange and unusual. In this episode, we're going to talk about the origins of some of your favorite Halloween traditions. Before we get to today's topic, however, we wanted to remind you to send us your spooky stories for special listener stories episode that we will be releasing in a little under two weeks, just in time for the big day. We're looking for stories of scary experiences you had that ended up having an ordinary explanation or that you'd like for us to try to debunk. If you have one, please email us at SpookyScienceSisters at gmail.com or contact us on one of our social media accounts. Additionally, we're asking listeners to help us grow by leaving a rating and or a review in the Apple Podcasts app. It only takes a few seconds to leave a rating and it helps us a ton. We also want to plug some guest appearances that we've done recently. Both Megan and I appeared on the Radio Wasteland show on Friday afternoon. Megan was also recently a guest on Max and Cassie's new podcast, You Might Love This, to talk about her love of volcanoes and geochemistry. If you want to hear more from us after you finish this episode, definitely go check those out. And with that, it's time for something spooky. So, Megan, did anything spooky happen to you in the last two weeks? So, Paige already said to me earlier today that we might not be the spooky science sisters this week. We might be the sleepy science sisters. (laughs) Um, Because Paige had a very long day. I also had a long day. We, um, because of like an indirect COVID exposure in my daughter's daycare room, we don't have daycare for two weeks, which meant that I had to wake up at five this morning so that way I could go to work for a few hours and then take care of her while my husband worked because his schedule is is less flexible so anyway so I'm very tired so my something spooky did not happen until this morning when I woke up I took the dog for a walk at like 5 30 this morning when it was still very dark out and yeah, I mean, I'm. we've already established that I'm, like, pretty good at creeping myself out. So it's, like, this is very possibly just nothing. But we were a couple blocks from the house. And I live on, like, a semi-busier road. But obviously, it was still pretty quiet because it was really early in the morning. But I heard this, like, car coming down the street or vehicle coming down the street that was like rattling super loud and at first I thought that it was just like somebody who had like a piece of shit trailer or something hooked up to their car but then I like turned around to look as they were coming towards us down the street and it was like somebody's car who was like the front end was like totally fucked up like parts of it were dragging they had no headlights and yeah they're just like driving down the street (laughs) and they sort of like slowed down a little bit when they got close to me like almost like they slowed down when they saw me and I was like I don't I mean I definitely probably spooked myself out but I was like is it did this person just like hit something and then drive off or something and like now I'm about to be murdered so I'm not like a witness to this (laughs) run or something (laughs) like that (laughs) so I got really nervous about it and it was really loud and like so I could hear them and I think they must have like taken like a left turn just down the road because you sort of head like towards the highway and stuff that way But for a little bit, it, like, almost sounded like they were turning around and, like, coming back around. Did you run? 
I like 100% hid behind a bush. (laughs) (laughs) Good choice. (laughs) Like there was like a hedge and it was dark. And so I just sort of like grabbed the dog and hid behind a bush until I like absolutely established that they were definitely getting further. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I just had a really bad feeling about it. And... I don't know. I was like, this is probably nothing. But like, then they tell you that people have gut feelings and it helps them. So, and it was like a little weird that they slowed down a little bit when they saw me. That's super weird. I've had that happen a couple of times and it scared the shit out of me. So I also probably would have hidden. Yes. Why hid behind a bush? (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. Yeah. So then I walked the rest of the way home and I was like very creeped out and just like, listening for that rattling sound to come back down the road and then of course like I heard sirens start to go off in the distance and that always kicks off the like coyote pack that Mm -hmm. lives on the golf course that's not far from us so like they started making noise and I was like let's get out of here Georgie (laughs) (laughs) so terrifying (laughs) so anyway it's uh it started out as an eventful day and then I chased my toddler around all day um and now i'm here trying to put together sentences (laughs) you're doing a great job (laughs) so good um (laughs) Paige, did anything happen to you that was spooky no nothing spooky i don't think i mean it's been a weird week but i don't think anything spooky's happened okay i know it's getting boring over here Sometime soon, though, it's coming. I can tell. Something yeah. fucked up is yeah, is on its well, way. For now, I'll just convince myself that I'm about to be murdered <laughs> <laughs> while I'm walking the dog. <laughs> uh, it was probably nothing. I mean, admittedly, like every night that I take the dog out to like go pee one last time at night, I like manage to creep myself out. So, oh yeah, I, um, whenever I would take, whenever I take the dog out and it's dark out, I'm like constantly like checking behind me and like right. peeking around cars yeah. and, or, like, you know, every running car. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, like every car that goes by, you're like, oh, I'm going to slow down. <laughs> right. They're here for me. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All of these cars know that I am out walking my dog right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or it's gonna be like some crime of opportunity. Like this is my chance. I did forget. I was gonna Google if there were any like hit and run accidents, though, and I forgot to. They might so. be better off if you don't. Why? I don't know. Because <laughs> they'll come find me. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, but what if I help solve a murder? Yeah, but what if you find out that he what this person just was following you? Wouldn't that freak you out more? Mm, probably, but I guess like I'd be doing my part to make sure that somebody found them. I don't know. It was really weird. Like I, like, why would you, why would you be driving your car like that? Maybe. I guess like maybe they were just like trying to get it to a shop or something, but it was like 530 in the morning. Yeah, that or like maybe their license or something were suspended. This is what I always assume. Their license is suspended. They hit a deer and they didn't want to get caught driving without a license. So they ditched the deer and went home. Oh. Well, that was like the world's. (laughs) biggest fucking deer then because our car <laughs> okay a moose <laughs> was fucked yes a moose in suburban illinois <laughs> definitely <laughs> um anyway it, it was a little weird it was a little weird i don't know <laughs> my dog is tiny so like he's not gonna do fuck all to help me if somebody attacks me <laughs> he'd be like i'm so glad to see you are you my new owner <laughs> uh, at least i, can give you, would I was saying you. give you my dog if you 
for a little yeah. bit. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of my dog. Hello, Georgie. I know. You good boy. Um <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, um, this is the I guess no, yeah, second of our October episodes and our Halloween season, spooky season it's a third. episodes. Was did we count vampires? That was the last one in September. Yeah, because it released in October. No, it didn't. Did it? No, it didn't. We're gonna pretend it did, just for like today. <laughs> <laughs> I consider uh, it a Halloween episode. Personally. Okay, I mean it was a good one for Halloween for sure. But um, but yeah, like I guess official, official. It's October Halloween special episode stuff. This is the second one. Um, but so I'm super excited. We've been like waiting for I think I thought of this quite a while ago so I've been waiting for months and months to get to do Halloween traditions and yeah so we should probably start doing that I'm so sleepy (laughs) 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 all right so we'll start with a little bit of history about the holiday and sort of how it becomes the holiday that we know today as Halloween. So I think most people at this point are familiar with the fact that Halloween started out as this pagan festival or celebration called Samhain. Um, or I've also seen that some people pronounce it Samhain. Um, but this is spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N. So you definitely want to say Sam Hain. Sam, <laughs> Sam Hain. <laughs> <laughs> and I only, I think I only found out that it's pronounced Samhain because they say it in the first episode of Outlander. So, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I saw that in your notes and I straight up yeah. looked it up because I'm like, there's no fucking way that's how you say it. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you say it. <laughs> I know. I I, yeah. I, f- I found it. And now I believe you. <laughs> yes. So that is, that's how you say it. Don't say Sam Hain. <laughs> <laughs> so it is based, or Samhain is, is this three-day ancient Celtic pagan festival that would have occurred sometime around the end of October, 1st of November. The Celts lived during the Iron Age, which, oh, thank you, Paige, for filling in the dates for that, which was (laughs) circa 500 to 332 BC in what we now know as Ireland, Scotland, the UK. So Samhain, which in modern Irish means summer's end, was a celebration that marked the end of summer, the end of the harvest, and the beginning of the Celtic New Year. So their calendar year was actually divided into two halves, a light half and a dark half. And so Samhain was the beginning of the dark half of the year. So you know, it's a time of death and rebirth to them, the end of this harvest period, the beginning of what was probably a pretty challenging existence in winter. And you sort of start to get these early uh, associations with this idea of, of, I guess, of death being associated with the holiday. Because for them, it truly was like that period of time truly was a matter of life and death. Did they have enough stuff stored up to survive this, you know, cold, dark winter (laughs) was about to descend (laughs) upon them. So it's always, you know, it's just sort of naturally and for a long time been this spooky time of the year, but I guess back then in a much more literal sense of like, is my family going to make it through the winter? (laughs) Yeah, it actually is kind of depressing. Yes. Yeah, that's the physical aspect, literal aspect of what's going on during this time of year. 
but they also had this this supernatural component to to it because they also believed that during Samhain time and space became flexible and that's how one of the things I read put it which I thought was interesting but this idea that the veil or the divide between life and death or between our world and other worlds and in this case other worlds like the fairy world um, was at its thinnest. So it still has the supernatural element to it. Um, and I read that the way that this was often celebrated was that they were, they would light bind, bind fires, bind fires. Yeah. They would light bind fires, <laughs> bonfires. Um, and then also read that there was like animal and you wrote this too, p- potentially human sacrifice. Yes. Um, and that they would just like essentially like get part party. They'd celebrate, get wasted, um, <laughs> <laughs> as you should. Um, and then I had also read somewhere that people would wear costumes to ward off ghosts. And I Got didn't it. see that. I didn't see that in a lot of the articles I read. I think that was in, um, the, like the history channel article I read, which you'll talk about a little bit. Uh, um, but <laughs> Then I also read another article or two that kind of made it sound like there's no actual, and I think you're going to talk about this, but there's no like actual evidence that any of this celebration occurred the the way that we think it did or the way that it's written that they did. Yes. Yeah. So that is what I was going to talk about next. So this is all... Yeah, what we think that they did (laughs) and what they've been (laughs) able to garner um, through, I guess, the literature or the history that's available. So the origin and the particulars of what happened during this Samhain festival are a bit mysterious because the Celts didn't keep written records. So what's available is this folkloric literature Uh, like the Celtic sagas. And you also had writings that were done by Roman authors because at one point the area was incorporated or I guess conquered is the better word um, into the Roman Empire. But they likely wouldn't have, I guess, done a true or done a faithful job of of transcribing these stories or transcribing these traditions. And in one historian's words, they they probably would have trashed the traditions. <laughs> so yeah, so we don't really know exactly what happened. This is just what they've been able to what historians think went on. And there's also some argument as to how much of this Samhain. So everybody, you know, immediately points to, you know, Samhain is the original Halloween. Um, But there is argument as to how much it actually contributed to the modern celebration of Halloween. However, I read this book called Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween by Lisa Morton. And she actually has a few books about Halloween. She's a historian. And she says that although historians have argued over how much Samhain really contributed to the modern celebration of Halloween, it seems likely that the Celtic festival's peculiar mix of harvest, rowdy celebration, and fearful supernatural beliefs gave Halloween much of its character. So, yeah. I mean, that just, like, pretty much sounds like a good time. Yeah, it sounds great. (laughs) Light up some bonfires. Except for the whole human sacrifice Sacrifice, part. yeah. <laughs> well, there, there are arguably a few people I wouldn't mind sacrificing. <laughs> like, here's the thing. <laughs> Based on where we're at in 2020, I mean, maybe we need a little human sacrifice. <laughs> To appease the ancient <laughs> gods. <laughs> that's what I. <laughs> that's what I've learned. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
So let's get back to Halloween the way it was meant to be celebrated. Uh, I am talking. Well, okay, yeah. Sorry, I thought you were going to say let's get back to talking about Halloween. But yeah, no, no, exactly. (laughs) Let's celebrate Halloween the way it was meant to be celebrated. (laughs) Fucking murdering people. (laughs) (laughs) It's taking a dark turn tonight. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So we start with Samhain. And (laughs) from an article from (laughs) history.com, which is the History Channel's website, they say that there was an association with the Romans' feralia ceremony, which was the culmination of parentalia, which was a celebration of the spirits of their ancestors. And they also say that, which, you know, that, I mean, that kind of seems like it goes with, with, with Halloween and Samhain for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But they also claim that there's this holiday that the Romans had to honor the goddess Pomona, whose symbol was the apple. And so everybody claims like, oh, like that's where we get bobbing for apples. And that's where we get this association of apples with Halloween. In the trick or treat book, though, it says that the Romans like most certainly did not have a day or festival to celebrate Pomona. And that this is like an error that was made by early historians and then just like continues to be propagated forward. So I had this in my notes that I was like, once again, the history channel disappoints me. (laughs) 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 It was like, you guys, I just like, what happened to you? Like, didn't the history channel used to be a reliable source? And like now it's just a fucking nightmare. I don't know if it was ever really reliable or if it was because because it was called the History Channel, we all just assumed it was, and now we're just finding out that we were wrong. That's very possible. Really, the second they started showing ancient aliens and skin It was all range, downhill. <laughs> it was all over <laughs> for the History Channel. <laughs> I would love to know like what the History Channel... Um, I don't want to buy. I want to say bio, but I don't know if that's the right word. Like the description is for the channel. Oh, like do they claim know. to be a legitimate history Probably. retelling channel? Probably, well, but either way, they definitely <laughs> have s- some questionable Halloween facts on their website. So fuck <laughs> off, <laughs> fuck off, Pomona. <laughs> This isn't about you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, um, on to the next religion. (laughs) Onward. So with the spread of Christianity, um, many of the pagan traditions were evolved and then reframed as Christian holidays. On May 13th, 609 A.D., the Pope established a celebration called All Saints Day or All Hallows Mus. <laughs> yeah. Either All Hallows or, or All Hallows Mus. All Hallows Mus. I don't know. That's, yeah. I mean, that's what okay. they called it in Middle English. So All Saints Day or uh, All Hallows Mus, which is what it was called in Middle English. Uh, so the day before that holiday would have been All Hallows Eve. And... Basically, what they did is they took a pagan holiday called Lemuria uh, that occurred on that day, May 13th. And like I said, they just kind of reimagined or adopted it and turned it into this Christian holiday. So Lemuria was a day where Roman pagans would try to placate their dead. And I think in their belief system, they believed that ghosts or lemurs, I guess, lemurs, I have no idea, would come up and haunt people. So in order to try and make them not do that, I guess, they'd pour milk on their graves and they would offer them little cakes, which reminds me of magicians. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> like it specifically said little cakes, which I loved. Um, but yeah, like Paige said, this is the Pope and the early Christians saw it as rather than try to fight against the pagan religion and which like I'm sure they also did, but <laughs> in terms of establishing, you know, Christianity, they found that it was better to reframe the pagan holidays and retain some of those traditions versus just like completely bulldozing them because it made it easier to convert pagans. Because they had success with kind of adopting the Lemuria holiday, uh, they then moved All Saints Day in the middle of the 8th century to November 1st in order to kind of take over the the Samhain traditions. Later, November 2nd was then added as All Souls Day to honor all dead Christians, not just saints. Uh, This is important because it gives Halloween its association with death and the supernatural. So before this, um, I mean... I don't really, do you know a whole lot about what All All Hallows Mus was prior to like what the celebration was or like what the day was? Well, so All Saints Day is, yeah, to honor Catholic saints or Christian saints. And then they added All Souls Day, which like you said, was like everybody who's dead and who was Christian or I guess in this case specifically Catholic to honor them. So it just like, it really, I guess, emphasizes that this is a festival about honoring your, um, honoring or celebrating, I guess, the, the people, the Christians that you've known that have passed on. It gives Halloween as we know it, this association, because there was definitely this, you know, sort of supernatural, you know, the veil between life and death is thin with the original pagan celebration of Samhain as well. All right. Well, that's Halloween. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) That's at least Halloween up until the Middle Ages, sort of. And so now we're going to take a look at how that history gets us to the Halloween traditions that we have today. So we have several of those that we're going to talk about. So the first one is, you know, I guess sort of the big one, right? We carve jack-o'-lanterns. We carve faces into pumpkins. And this uh, is supposedly related to a piece of folklore uh, a story about a guy named Stingy Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so Stingy Jack is a trickster and, I don't know, just, just not a great guy. And he tricks the devil. And I think there are, they're saying that he, the, he tricks the devil like multiple times, like once to delay the devil taking his soul and then again later but he tricks the devil out of taking his soul but when he finally dies he was not a good guy like i said so heaven also doesn't want him (laughs) (laughs) so he is condemned to wander purgatory um but the devil gives him a piece of hellfire And in some of the versions, it's just he gives them a lump of coal. But either way, this is to light his way as he wanders purgatory for eternity. And he puts this in a carved out turnip. And so because of this story, people began carving out gourds. And eventually, Americans substituted... Um, well, gourds and turnips, and eventually Americans substituted pumpkins because they're easier to carve and they were native to <laughs> America <laughs> um, and they didn't have them available in Europe. And the idea was that they were either put out to sort of scare evil spirits or it was you know, thought that they would like confuse Jack, like he was out and about on the night. But 
the name comes from, you know, he's Jack of the Lantern and then eventually gets shorted to, shortened to Jack-O-Lantern. And that first Jack-O-Lantern reference comes from uh, author Nathaniel Hawthorne. I love this story. I think and it's fun. I actually didn't know about the turnips until, like, we first started looking into this. Did oh, you? Oh, really? Yeah, I had no idea. Okay. Um, I'd seen pictures of, like, yeah, like, the turnips carved before. They're which, like, fucking, seems like a real pain in the butt. <laughs> they're terrifying. And I've decided that that's what I want to do from now on is carve turnips. Yeah. Yeah. Have you I ever mean, seen a turnip in real life? Good point. I mean, like, they exist, but, like... But they're But, like, small. have you ever gotten one? Yeah, like, they're <laughs> small. Yes, I have like seen one in Good Point. Like... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I just mean, like, okay, my point was not, like, oh, you fucking idiot, you haven't seen a turnip. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was more, like, they're so tiny. Like, they're right. more, like potatoes right like they're also roots aren't they yeah they're pretty yeah they are yeah. and they're yeah they're, they're not it's like, like pum- they're not like pumpkins or squash or whatever where they're big things that are easy to carve they're like they're i mean you can have big turnips but like yeah they're more like i guess potatoes yeah they kind little... of look like giant radishes don't they uh, I don't think do so. Do I really know? Do I know what a turnip looks like? It's a unfair. radish is more like round and purple, isn't it? I thought a turnip was more like it's like a. In, I would say it's in between. They like look a, like giant radishes. Radish carrot. Tell me I'm wrong. Google <laughs> turnip right now. It looks like. I guess it depends on the variety of turnip. But yeah, your radish carrot is looks like this one picture. Yeah. Yeah, they would be super hard to carve, but that's right. kind of why I want to do it. Yeah, because like there's no like there's no pulp in them. Like they're more like a potato texture, I would think. Yeah, or how even would you yeah, like out? you said, like a carrot texture or radish texture. Like how the flip are you going to carve that out? I have never eaten a turnip, though. I will say that I've eaten a radish, had, and I think they're oh. disgusting. But oh, I like radishes, but I've had turnips like cut up into. Like baked vegetables and stuff. They're good, but hmm. they don't taste that different from potatoes. Huh. Okay. Well, we're <laughs> hopefully going to be together for Halloween. We're going to carve some turnips and we will post the results. It's going to be, we're going to have turnip carving contests. And there I've just now decided. is a good chance I'm going to give up halfway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You heard it here, though. We promise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even if we're not together, you better buy some fucking turnips and you're going to carve some turnips. I'll do it. Okay. I'm very excited. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, the legend. I keep saying, like, folklore. I have no idea what I'm talking about. The story, the legend of... Of the, Stingy Jack. The legend. The folklore. The myth. The legend of Stingy Jack. The man. Um, Stingy Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, though. It's a fun story. So, and I didn't write down the super detailed version, but, and like, you know, we're supposed to be spooky science sisters, and it's like, there, there's no science behind this. Like, this is just, this is just superstition. <laughs> The, we're just so, the spooky sisters tonight. We're just the, the sleepy spooky, spooky sisters. sisters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okie dokie. Tell so, me about trick or treating. Yeah, the next one that we took on was trick or treating. And there are like a lot of stories as to how or why trick or treating has become a thing. Yeah. Um, Which sort of suggests to me that it's like no one fucking knows. Nobody knows what's going on here. (laughs) Um, So some people argue that the origin is from the pagans leaving out goodies to bribe or placate the spirits or other creatures out during Samhain. Yes. And then a little bit later, the idea of trick-or-treating is potentially related to medieval Christian traditions So people were encouraged around the festival or holiday of All Souls Day to pray for souls stuck in purgatory and were told that if enough prayers were offered, 
then a soul could ascend to heaven. And I had some like questions about this. Like, were we praying for specific people or was this just like sort of like generally? Like how how did these souls that are ascending get chosen out of like all the ones in purgatory? It had, you had to have been praying for specific. Yeah, but like, how would you know? Anyway. Oh, that's had, a good point. I had some questions about the. <laughs> well, just random ones get, get chosen. <laughs> you, you were. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I, it, I was just a little confused about the logic behind this, which, I mean, I, I probably should just accept it (laughs) you were you were gooder than some of the other souls i guess so um but anyway so this leads to um children and beggars going souling door to door and like the word is actually souling which i think is a really weird word um but they would do this in exchange for something called soul cakes which were spiced cakes filled with raisins which sound delightful in exchange for these the beggars would say that they would offer up prayers for these souls in purgatory but like Again, that's like weird. <laughs> like, here, maybe I'm just an asshole. <laughs> like, I'm thinking like, again, like if, if you took somebody's soul cakes, did that mean that your prayers were like going specifically towards people that they knew? Or were we just sort of like doing this for the general good of souls in purgatory? I'm going for general good. That seems to make the most sense i guess so <laughs> even though anyway yeah yeah that's it's what we're fine. going with it's fine but anyway <laughs> I, had, I had some i had some questions about the logistics <laughs> behind how purgatory works but <laughs> i'm <laughs> just a heathen so i guess i just don't know <laughs> <laughs> all right all right and then some sources argue that the modern trick-or-treating stems from what's called bell snickling, uh, which I just think is great. I, I have questions about this, but I'll get through okay. it first. Okay. Um, this is a tradition in German-American communities where children dress up in costume and then they'll call on their neighbor- neighbors to see if the adults can guess their identities. And then in one version of the practice, the children are rewarded with food or other treats if nobody can identify them. My question, though, is that I thought bell snickling was like a Christmas tradition. So, so did I. Like, I also thought that bell snickling was Christmas because in the office, <laughs> Dwight, <laughs> Dwight does Shroot family Christmas and like he dresses up like bell snickle, <laughs> which is hilarious <laughs> but yeah so i don't know if it was like just because it was around the same time that they sort of think that it just kind of got influenced the idea it. from it yeah i have no idea okay that makes more sense yeah so that because i also thought that it was more like a christmas thing so we've gone through three possible origins of trick-or-treating and like here's the real answer it's probably just like they all sort of snowball into one another and become modern (laughs) trick-or-treating but honestly a lot of halloween as we know it today was brought to america by scottish and irish immigrants and they're the ones that actually really bring i guess sort of the the like trickster trouble causing side of halloween to america which i sort of love because i have like scottish and irish heritage um mostly german but definitely significant scottish and irish heritage and it's like yeah (laughs) i'm a trickster (laughs) we're bringing the wildness to halloween the scots believed that on halloween that was when the bogeyman or boogeyman would come out and cause trouble and that you know they could sort of be 
we could be wading through any gate. So it really had this, the holiday really had this association of pranking with them. Um, They potentially had this, their own secular version of this souling practice of going around and asking for soul cakes in exchange for prayers called guising in which they would have offered jokes or songs or other, I guess, quote unquote tricks in exchange for treats. So in the early 20th century, Halloween is, I guess, because of the influence of, again, the Scottish and Irish immigrants like really gets a little out of hand it becomes known as <laughs> mischief mischief night or devil's night and kids are out getting into all sorts of trouble they're like tipping over outhouses setting things on fire derailing street cars hasn't hasn't devil's night turned into like a different night now you might be right. That does Bec- sound like it's a thing. Because I feel, and, and, I, and I'm only remembering this really because I remember it being talked about um, in Detroit that there was specifically a night where things, like one night a year or whatever, where people tend to like set things on fire or things get kind of crazy oh. in the city. And I thought it was like still the called. the night before Halloween or something like that? It might be. I don't remember. I'll look it up while you're. Interesting. Yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to double check that. But anyway, so uh, I did watch this like very hilarious drunk history segment <laughs> that was like five minutes long <laughs> that um, kind of referenced this or explained Mischief Night, Devil's Night, and basically attributes this part of what we kind of know as Halloween to a specific woman named Elizabeth Krebs who lived in Hiawatha, Kansas, and was, like, real pissed that kids kept destroying her garden every year (laughs) um, on Halloween. So she, like, basically decides she's going to throw this, like, massive Halloween party and parade and try to keep them out of trouble. And so she's potentially the one who sort of says, like, hey, like, let's give the kids something, like, structured to do so that way they're not out getting into all manner of mischief um, on the night of Halloween. That is brilliant. (laughs) I mean, that's just like generally parenting right there. (laughs) (laughs) That's parenting a toddler for sure. It's like, let's just give you a structured activity. So like we just keep you out of trouble for as much of your life as we can. (laughs) So anyway... (laughs) But again, Halloween kind of gets a little bit out of hand in America, um, potentially spurred on by the Great Depression because, you know, it's generally a desperate time. The Halloween of 1933 is actually called by some Black Halloween because of how much damage was done in some cities on that night. So, you know, Potentially, it's this Elizabeth Krebs woman in 1913 who comes up with this idea to kind of give everybody structured activities, but potentially it's also just sort of generally homeowners who start bribing kids with homemade treats like popcorn balls to prevent them from causing trouble. And in 1939 is when you get um, the first appearance of the phrase or the description of the custom of trick-or-treating in print for the first time so it takes a while so like trick or treating as a trick or treating as a concept is fairly recent or like as we know it now is fairly Mm -hmm. recent uh yeah and i i had read that it really started getting didn't get start getting popular until the 50s which i yeah i got like i had thought it was popular prior to that Right. And like popular, I guess, in like the commercial, the more commercial way that we know it. Right, right, right. (laughs) Yeah. So then I looked specifically into like why candy, like why did candy become the treat that everybody gets now? Um, And until the middle of the 20th century, it there really was like kind of anything that you would get for Halloween. And I've gotten some of these things, but... Um, people would get toys, which I think is cool. Like I would have wanted toys as a kid 
trick or treat everywhere <laughs> you go, you get a new toy. Yeah. Um, so it, some people would give coins, fruit, nuts, uh, like you said, popcorn balls, any of those kinds of treats. It wasn't, it really wasn't candy that was given out. Uh, but with the rise of the popularity of trick or treating in the 50s, uh, it inspired co- candy companies to make a marketing push with small, individually wrapped pieces of candy. Um, so then, basically, out of convenience, people just decided to buy the candy. Uh, but it didn't really dominate other treats for trick or treating until parents started fearing really anything that was unwrapped in the 70s. So the 70s is when all the the scares, I guess, started happening or the stories started coming up about people doing weird stuff to candy or doing weird stuff to unwrapped things. Um, so people uh, turn to candy. Got it. I, so when I was a kid trick or treating, I can remember getting like some quarters sometimes. I definitely remember getting like popcorn balls, but I feel like they were like, they were like pre-packaged ones. So you can still buy those in stores, mm-hmm. um, but they're, yeah, they're like pre-packaged individual things. Like I, I don't have any distinct memories of getting like homemade goods at all from anybody I remember, at the point in time when I was trick-or-treating. Yeah. I remember there was one man who always gave little Debbie's, um, there were a couple places that I got fruit, like apples and stuff. And yeah, I definitely you know, got an apple at one point. Definitely had to throw or those another. away. Um, <laughs> and then I, I think there was like somebody who gave out like cans of soda. But other than that, everything was candy. Yeah. I never got any coins. That would have been kind of cool. Yeah. Which is like sort of funny because like kids fucking hate getting produce and stuff like that like apples or fruit or whatever and it's like produce is fucking expensive (laughs) depending on how many like as an adult depending on how many trick-or-treaters you were getting if you were giving out apples like damn right right just give a damn bag of skittles it's cheaper it probably is to give like to even give full-size candy bars it might be cheaper depending on the apples that you're giving out Um, (laughs) I am like 99.9% sure that I'm about to tell you a true story, but there's 0.1% of me that's wondering if maybe I just made this up some night in my sleep. Uh, but I would swear to you when I was younger and we were trick or treating, there was a house that we called the doll house and it was this older woman who lived there and her entire living room was like floor to ceiling display cases of porcelain dolls. <laughs> this sounds like something you dreamed. <laughs> I'm like pretty sure this is a real thing. And now okay. I am going to try to find someone who yeah, would Steven remember. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I know I used to go with like Michelle trick or treating. So she'd probably be the best person to ask. But okay. You'd, like, go inside this woman's house? Yeah. She had, like, buckets of candy, and you would get, like, a handful from each bucket. Like, inside her house? It was the shit. Yes. That's, like... The shit. How you get murdered. I know. So that's why I'm not really sure if I'm making this up. But but I would swear to you this happened, and it was, like, my favorite house to go to. Okay. Did you have any neighbors that would, like dress up and try to scare the shit out of kids i don't remember anybody really doing that no i mean i've done that but i don't think anyone's ever done that to me okay i do but i think today like get in trouble for it yeah probably which is a bummer all right well yeah so here's the here's the thing trick-or-treating we've got four different possible origins but again they probably all combine into what we know today or what we do today okay so our next big tradition is that people (laughs) (laughs) wear costumes on halloween so i think Paige mentioned this before but again it's like nobody fucking knows where the halloween traditions came from so (laughs) it's just sort of all over the place there are like different things yeah which is funny because you read articles and people are like, you know, people put very, you know, written in stone statements in their articles. And it's like, but 
you really don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so the pagans would potentially disguise themselves from, and I read this a few places, from otherworldly creatures like fairies um, or ghosts that came out during Samhain so that they would be left alone. So again, it's it's got this like... I mean, it's still got this It's very supernatural trickster association with it. You didn't want the ghost to pick on you, so you would dress up like a ghost, so they'd be like, oh, it's just another, another ghost. Just I'll another just ghost. Just, just another ghost. <laughs> okay, so then in medieval times, we're on to this All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Day, All Souls' Day, three-day festival. Um, so, again, that three-day festival really continues because Samhain was three days as well. But this is potentially when beggars got rowdy and drunk on Hall- All Hallows' Eve. And it was basically convenient for them in that case to hide their identities and hide any bad behavior by wearing a mask and some of these uh people would go house to house in costumes to put on little plays to be rewarded with food and drinks so again potentially there's some trick-or-treat influence there as well and in i guess the uk in britain november 5th 1605 is when guy fox tries to blow up parliament and he is captured and tortured and eventually hanged. And as part of this research, I found out that he was like tortured so badly that they had to like carry him up to the <laughs> platform <laughs> to hang him because he was like in very bad shape. So Yay. not great for him. And that he like wasn't even really the like he wasn't the end all be all mastermind of this plan. So he sort of gets scapegoated a little bit. Anyway, big aside. So November 5th, remember, remember the 5th of November becomes bonfire night and they, you know, turn it into this big thing where children wear masks. They wear Guy Fox masks to mock him and they burn effigies of him and they, um, they run around causing mischief. So I guess some things thought like, or something sort of suggested that this like contributed to the costume wearing on Halloween. Whereas other things that I read sort of suggested that this was something that was basically like pulling people away from the Halloween traditions. So a little bit unclear in that huh. respect. And in the U S of course, costumes get commercialized and they become part of this effort to try to try to tame things a little bit because people are getting real pissed about their stuff being ruined <laughs> <laughs> or about things getting set on fire. <laughs> so again, you know, you have these publications coming out um, from companies saying, you know, you should host a Halloween party or you should have a Halloween parade and dress your kids up in costumes. And Anoka, Minnesota, which I found about, out about this not too long ago, like maybe a couple months ago. And I'm like very pissed that I've lived in my, in the Midwest for a significant portion the majority of my life, really. And, like, nobody has told me that I've been within driving distance of a place that has had a Halloween parade every year since 1920 and bills itself as the Halloween capital of the world. So that's our trip after Salem, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, yeah. Here's the thing, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to just being like generally pissed about the condition of the world and people being total fucking assholes we are per we've been personally hurt by this situation because Paige and i were supposed to go on a girl's trip long weekend to salem massachusetts 
the weekend before Halloween and do all sorts of spooky historical things and have a fabulous, wonderful time. But we can't now. And I'm like supposed to be there a week from today. And like, who even knows if we're going to be able to go next year at this rate? Right. I'm not counting on it. Yeah. And people are, are just, just, you've ruined this for me, people. So hopefully we get to go next year. But here's my little PSA. There is still a pandemic. Cases are going up. Even in Europe where they had like actually did a good job with the initial wave. Well, some countries did a good job with the initial (laughs) wave and their case numbers got really low. They're seeing a big resurgence of cases. This is like basically playing out like the pandemic, the Spanish flu in 1918, a hundred fucking years ago. And we're doing the same goddamn things now and people are dying. It is not over. Wear fucking mask. Just, just, don't don't go hanging out with your friends and doing all this stuff. I should be getting ready to go to fucking Salem next week. <laughs> don't ruin it for us next year yes. is what we're trying if to I say. If I don't get to go next year, <laughs> some shit's going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> then we really are bringing back the original Halloween traditions. <laughs> it's fucking human sacrifices and burning shit to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> this is the podcast episode that gets me arrested <laughs> or at least put on like some sort of like i don't know some sort of watch watch list <laughs> <laughs> she, she might be a halloween terrorist <laughs> god damn right <laughs> i'm okay. scared i'm scared um <laughs> On to our next topic. Some of my angriness. (laughs) Let's talk about cats. (laughs) Okay, so... Yes, the next thing we're going to talk about is black cats. And I guess this, like, isn't just a Halloween thing. This is just, like, a general, like, superstition type thing that black cats are bad luck or that black cats are scary or evil um though before i start this i will say that i read um that black cats are no longer like adopted less than other cats for a long time yeah apparently that's like not a thing anymore um i mean i I read a couple places yeah and apparently like i read i read a couple places that It was still the case. And then I've read, I think it was the ASPCA, I think, said, I'd have to go back and double check that. But I definitely read that, like, that is no longer the case. So, I mean, that doesn't mean you should stop adopting black cats. It just means that the black cats are loved now. So that's good. Anyways, black cats. Yeah. (laughs) But don't they also, like, um, don't do we think do we think there's any truth to like places not letting people adopt black cats on halloween because they're afraid that they're gonna do fucked up shit to them that's oh. a little urban legend that i heard heard but i don't know if it's true i mean that wouldn't surprise me but i, I don't think i've ever even heard that that's terrifying yeah like i had heard that like they wouldn't let people adopt <laughs> adopt them uh, they wouldn't let people adopt them on halloween because they're afraid they're gonna do weird stuff to them but i sort of wonder if that was like some urban legend that arose out of the like satanic panic stuff which was like in the 70s or 80s or whatever i don't know yeah i can't say that i've ever heard that anyway anyway tell black me about cats. <laughs> so I read uh, like five or so articles that specifically talked about Pope Gregory the Ninth being the whole issue behind the black cats stuff. 
Like okay. him, uh, a lot of people believe that he called for a massacre. And in some some articles, I read that it was black cats, and others I read it was all cats. Um, but saying that they were the like basically devil reincarnate, like they are the devil, devil cats. Um, <laughs> and supposedly, like after this, people started burning cats in the streets. Um, and they have like this, like whole, like an actual like cat massacre. And like I said, it sounds based off what I read, a lot of the articles make it seem as if this is all cats. This isn't just black cats. Okay. Um, but like side note, cat massacre would be a great band name. Oh, it really would. (laughs) 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 Anyway, (laughs) um, and so then when the when the black death so when the plague occurs in the 1300s um everybody blames the cat massacre because people think that the lack of cats causes this increase in the black rat population and the black rats are what carry the plague ah, so okay. that's where a Gee, lot of people doing things that are not good for them and don't make any scientific sense so that way lots of more people get sick and die hmm that would never happen not today (laughs) (laughs) anyway (laughs) um so this is you know story after story i read but then i started reading that none of this is even true um And it's, I can't, I mean, I don't know, you know, I wasn't there, obviously, I can't say, I don't know that anybody now can, but um, they're saying that there, maybe it's true, but that there's nothing really to prove that it is. There's no evidence to show that a cat massacre ever occurred. Um, There's maybe some drawings or some art that show people, you know, burning a cat or doing weird things with the cat. Uh, But there's also lots of, you know, that same evidence, a lot of pictures, a lot of art that's done with people having cats as house pets. So um, it's hard to say whether or not this cat massacre really happened. And and even if it did, whether or not it was specifically black cats or if it was all cats. But then a lot of, I don't know, a lot of what I guess a lot of people probably know about black cats now is that uh, they were thought to be like a witch's familiar. So there's a little story about um, kind of where this thought came from. And it was in the 1560s in England uh, on a night, a moonless night, a uh, father and son. <laughs> it's very of important course. that it was moonless. Um, and they definitely 100% know that to be true. Right. Absolutely. Um, a father and his son are traveling and they are, they pass, they pass. Wow. They cross paths with a black cat and i don't really understand why but apparently the story goes that they start pelting the cat with rocks which like just makes them a bunch of dick bags um but they start throwing rocks at this cat until this poor cat goes home to the woman who at the time was accused of being a witch the following day the father and son saw the woman who lived in the house and when she came out of the house she was limping and bruised so they assumed that witches could turn themselves into black cats at night to roam around unobserved. So I guess that's where a lot of that thought of um, the black cat being the witch's familiar came from. Got it. So basically but, these guys are just like fucking animal abusers. Right. And then they also turn out to be misogynists. <laughs> Hashtag get woke. <laughs> uh, and then they cause this whole problem f- for the fucking cats. So that, I mean, I don't really know. Once again, there's any real good story as to why black cats are seen as unlucky. Um, but this is where a lot of, I guess, those stories come from. Yeah. I like black cats. I Although love I, black cats. Yes. Although I think I had heard that, like, I think just black animals in general, because uh, it happens to dogs as well. They, I think they do tend to get adopted a little bit less because they tend to not 
they tend to be a little bit more difficult to photograph well. So if you're looking at photographs of shelter animals, then, you know, the, the black ones are just a little bit harder to photograph and get good pictures of. So people tend to avoid them a little bit more. That's what I, hmm, interesting. So just like, or, you know, yeah. Like, if you even like adopting online and you don't, you I mean, you're looking at photos right. to go visit. Yeah. yeah. Then like if, you know, it's not a great photo and it's a black, because it's a black animal and the camera has trouble with it, then you might just skip over them. So hmm. I like specifically would want a black cat though. <laughs> yeah. I love black cats. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Maybe you're just a witch. Can. Also true. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So it's time for our next tradition, which tradition. is bobbing for, <laughs> which is bobbing for apples, which does not have anything to do with the goddess Pomona history <laughs> channel. Get it together. Um, but apples do make a lot of appearances in Celtic mythology. And have connections to the other world, which I think means like fairies and shit. But anyway, uh, they also have these strong associations with various fortune telling traditions that were associated with Halloween. So I guess bobbing for apples, which I had no idea it used to be considered a form of divination. So this is according to NPR. So they would, people would obviously we all know what bobbing for apples is, right? Dunk their heads into a vat of water, try to bite into an apple. Um, but women would mark the apples with names, I guess, of like potential future spouses. And then whoever's apple they pulled out would be the person that they would marry. Um, so I guess it's just like the bobbing for apples version of like, what were those little paper foldy things you used to do in like middle school? Oh, um, what are they called? You know what I'm talking um, about? Yeah, let me think about it for a second. I I'll get back to you. Okay. Or like that mash game, or that mash game. Yeah. So this sort of seems like that. <laughs> anyway. <You're a> <laughs> yes. Um. So. They probably, the Bobby for Apple tradition probably comes from, again, Scottish or Irish traditions. So they give us, again, a lot of our modern Halloween things that we do. Um, but there's another one, also apples, which this one, oddly enough, I had actually heard of before. But a woman would stand in front of a mirror on Halloween with an apple and she would either eat it or she would slice it up and she would look in the mirror and like see the face of the person, her beloved in the glass. So like whoever she was supposed to marry in the glass. So that's sort of a, a weird one, but apparently that was part of uh, the traditions that were described by the famous poet, Robert Burns, because he did some writing about various Halloween traditions. So that's Bob and for apples. Cootie catcher. Cootie catcher. That's correct. That is correct. I don't know why it was called a cootie catcher, but it was. What was it called a cootie catcher? I don't know. But either way, that's 100% what it's called. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we bob for apples. We also light things on fire because bonfires are a big part of Halloween. Although, like, I feel like, it, are they a big part of Halloween anymore? I don't. I don't know. Th I mean, they're a big part of my life, but I don't know they're a big part of Halloween. Yeah, like I feel like that must be an older tradition. I don't know. So the thing less is like bonfires, candles, but like we said before, bonfires they lit big ones during the Samhain festival, and you know part of it was they were performing potentially. Well, they're sacrificing or burning certain crops and animals as sacrifices to their gods. There was apparently fortune telling. Paige said they might have worn costumes. 
And one of the traditions that they mentioned was that people would take the coals from the sacred fire, this big bonfire that had been lit by the Druids, which I think were basically their priests, and use it to relight their fire at home, which would have gone out while they were out celebrating and getting drunk with all their friends. So I think the one thing about uh, this, about bonfires that I guess definitely passes to today is that these big bonfires probably would have attracted insects and insects means that you attract bats. So some people say that we get this association of bats with Halloween because of these bonfires. And so candles are bonfires along with lighting candles in, I guess, more Christian traditions. uh, There's this association with sort of like lighting the way for souls who are seeking the afterlife or potentially for souls who are like stuck in purgatory or potentially for like protecting your property. So it's, it's all over the place. It could be a lot of things again. (laughs) Now we're going to talk about um, some of the, I don't know, I guess the, the spookiest uh, Halloween legends, which is the razor blades and apples and the poison and the candy or just, you know, tainted candy. Uh, yeah. and, and whether or not it's even true and if it isn't, where did it come from? Yeah. So this is more like debunking. Like this is more like contemporary or urban legends, like not actually the traditional folklore origins of Halloween. Right. See, we got to the debunking eventually. It took us some time. <laughs> <laughs> um. So... I just, I put this note in here because I just think it's funny that they specifically, so there's a point specifically where people were researching Halloween sadism, um, which are crimes specifically committed using Halloween treats or customs. And they basically concluded that like the threat is greatly exaggerated. That like there may be, you know, has have been a couple of small things that have happened or things that are like happening around the same time as Halloween or they've happened to candy once before but like overall there's not really much threat here yeah um i mean i guess thinking of it from like this thinking of it from i guess the scientific or like the psychological perspective which is what we typically do on this show but again this is special spooky halloween episode i would think that Yeah, a lot of it is probably just coincidence, right? And, like, people thinking that these things are, like, noticing these things more around this time of year. And so it sort of, like, becomes this association. Yeah. Or or maybe, like, people are more tempted to, like, do weird shit because, again, they have this, like, subconscious association of, like, this is when I'm supposed to do these things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, though I don't even think there's – there are many things that have even happened truly on Halloween. Like a lot of it, um, a lot of the research has shown that it's, you can't even link it to Halloween or it happening on Halloween. It's just a lot of it is candy. Like because it's candy, I guess it's linked to Halloween somehow. Um, (laughs) Speaking of candy, I just opened up a apple pie Kit Kat bar. Ooh. Which is a special one that they've released for this fall. So anyway, um, not great. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it is what it is. Um, (laughs) Something I've learned in my however many years, five years in the flavor industry is that pumpkin spice is like really fucking hard to get right. Mm, It's like really because you have to get like all the green notes in there and it's just like really the pumpkin flavor is really tough. So anyway, got it. This is apple pie flavored though. <laughs> oh, I thought you said pumpkin pie. <laughs> oh yeah, is it witch's so, brew? Um, no, it just says apple pie. I don't oh, know fuck. what witch's brew is. <laughs> you didn't care about pumpkin pie at all. <laughs> anyway, no. But I appreciate the story about it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Okie doke. Um. 
So some of the stories uh, that have kind of been linked to this fear about poisoning candy. Uh, The first is that in the 70s, there was a man who purposely poisoned his own children with putting cyanide in pixie sticks. Um, I think that is just the saddest story. It is terrible. Well, and he also apparently didn't just give it to his children. Uh, He gave it to a couple others. And, and, And to be fair, it sounded like this one happened around Halloween. But like still. So fuck that guy. Right. (laughs) (laughs) A, fuck that guy. B, my understanding is like he wasn't just handing it out to like every trick-or-treater. Not that that makes it better, but you know, it wasn't like this whole fear about this. You know, It was like a premeditated like attack on specific people in his life. Right. But it is definitely where, like, I had heard that one before. It's definitely where um, a major source of one of those stories has come from. But he's like that type of person, numero uno on the human sacrifice list. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Although, I guess, presumably, if you're going to do like human sacrifices, like, you got to sacrifice the good people, you know? Right. Like, the gods don't want, like, the shitbag people. They want to know, like, you are willing to sacrifice the good people. So this changes everything for you, I hope. Are you still willing to sacrifice people? Um, yeah. That makes it tough. (laughs) 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 Uh, Okie dokie. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Tell uh, me more about candy. In the 19 19- Well, this one's actually funny enough not about candy, but um for some reason it increased this fear of tainted candy and and I don't I mean I suppose just because it's small. Um but in the 80s there was an issue with some acetaminophen um that was or Tylenol which was laced with cyanide and it was put on the shelves and sold. Ooh, Have you no. heard about this? Um, it sounds like vaguely familiar, but not really. <laughs> um, and the case went unsolved, so they couldn't figure out who did it. And I got, and maybe that's kind of what increased this fear of tainted candy is that they couldn't figure out who did it. Um, so they're, you know, thinking maybe they're going to do something to the candy too. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like somebody like would get access or get the idea to like poison something. Because it would have had to be somebody like – at the factory, right? You'd think. Yeah. You'd think so. And then, and this one obviously is the earliest one, but in 64, there was a New York woman named Helen Feel? File? Um, and she was P-F-E-I-L. I don't know. File? Feel? Yeah. File? Feel? File. One of the two. File. Um, was arrested for handing out things like ant poison and dog biscuits to kids. Oh, no. Um. And when questioned, the housewife said that she was joking and that she gave the items to kids she felt were too old to be trick-or-treating. So this one actually did occur on Halloween, but like it wasn't like she's poisoning the candy. She's just like straight up handing handing ant poison to kids or dog biscuits to kids as a joke. Like, haha, this is a treat or a trick. Um the, sure. the police obviously didn't find it very funny, but she apparently <laughs> thought she was funny. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so again, like, sure, I get that that was probably a little scary, but I mean, it's not she like she was doing it like with the intention of actually killing any of those. Right. Kids. She wasn't sticking ant poison in, you know, a sucker or in some a bag of Skittles, or she wasn't giving the ant poison to a kid who would be, who would have been too young to understand what it was. She was like just mm-hmm. being a bitch. So yeah, it's okay. Um, like we've learned for older kids to go trick or treating because if they're not trick or treating, they could be doing other stupid shit. Like, knocking over outhouses or burning things down so if you see an older kid trick-or-treating just give them some fucking candy and let them go on their way i figure it's like let kids hang on to innocent traditions or like hang on to their youthfulness for as long as they can right it's fine if a 17 year old 
wants to come knock on my door and get candy, I'm fine with that. And, like, people have also pointed out that it might be a kid who has um, either, like, well, has some sort of developmental disorder where, like, they might look older, but I guess mentally, like, they may not be that old, you know? So, like, mm-hmm. they might still be out trick-or-treating and, like, people are being shitty to them because they're like, oh, they're too old to be trick-or-treating. And it's like, well, they, yeah. Like, just let kids be kids. It's also, fine. I'm 20, I'm 28 years old. And if I walk up to your house with a fucking basket and say trick or treat, I still expect candy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. I say trick or treat, That's I receive candy. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly. That. <laughs> um. Anyway, so yeah, that's like PSA. Like, don't be a shithead to kids who are just like trying to have some innocent fun for, you know, potentially the last year that they get to do it. But also, so I did Megan's weird dream stories last time. Another really weird dream. <laughs> 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 which was uh relate because you brought up skittles <laughs> and i had this dream like i know i had this dream multiple times and by multiple maybe only twice but i still feel like that's like enough for it to be notable i had a dream where i like found or bought a bag of skittles but they, like, weren't really Skittles. They were, like, little radio transmitters with tiny antennas in them. So. Um, what is... I don't know what that means. I don't either. <laughs> I had that dream more than once. Wait. <laughs> did anything happen in the dream? Or did you just discover that the Skittles I don't, like, I don't remember. Skittles. It was, like, a... It was an otherwise, like, elaborate dream. And... Like, there was a lot of other stuff happening, and I think it was related to that. But, like, the the only part of it that I remember was the radio transmitter Skittles. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Which, I mean, I don't know. This day and age, I might be, like, more worried that some person's trying to, like, low jack my kid with some sort of, like, weird transmitter so they can come find them and take them. <laughs> Your mind is a complicated place. (laughs) (laughs) Sleepy side sisters. Um, Anyway. So the other thing that people think about when they like urban legends for Halloween is like, oh, people put razor blades in apples. And I had read a book some years ago that talked about that and it was like that is not a thing like i think there was like a single case where somebody found like i don't even think it was razor blade i think it was like a piece of glass or something in an apple but it was like the person had been storing the apples in their garage there was some broken glass in the floor the bag fell over and one of them got glass in it so it was like an accident okay so The last thing in terms of Halloween traditions and getting to our modern Halloween is, but like Halloween today has gotten like very like extreme, morbid, death, gore, horror, scariness. Um, But that probably has some pretty old origins. So first, the All Saints and All Souls celebrations were probably influenced by the Black Death. And around the time that that plague was happening, you saw a lot of images of death, of Grim Reapers in artwork. And these depictions find their way into things associated with the All Saints and All Souls celebrations. And then shortly after the plague, you, uh, around the year 1480, you start to get these widespread witch hunts across Europe. And it's during these that tens of thousands of people, mostly women, because men are fucking assholes, were killed (laughs) 
<laughs> because they were <laughs> like barely being sleepy while we record makes me very aggressive. Um, <laughs> were killed because they were suspected of witchcraft. Um, and some of that was like you still had play going around. And a lot of that was like with respect to they were thought to like have caused or be spreading the plague because people had like no idea how disease actually spread and apparently they were just killing all the cats (sighs) jesus christ okay (laughs) so it is during the reign of king henry the eighth and his daughter elizabeth the first which like King Henry VIII was like already kind of a nut job. Um, but he uh, is the one who, or it's during his reign that All Hallows Eve is <clears throat> identified as a time when witches would gather, or it's like identified as some sort of Sabbath to them. But probably what this is related to is he had beef with the Vatican. Uh, and wanted to separate the Church of England from them and viewed All Saints Day as a papal holiday. So this was sort of a way to distance the Church of England from that holiday or try to. And so another quote from that book, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, says more specifically about witches, A spectacular witch trial took place during the reign of the Protestant King James I. In 1590, dozens of Scots were accused of attempting to prevent James from reaching his queen-to-be, Anne of Denmark, by gathering on Halloween night and then riding the sea in sieves, sieves, right in the sea in sieves, <laughs> while creating <laughs> storms by tossing live cats tied to human body parts into the water. After the infamous North Berwick witch trials, as they were called, Halloween was forever to be firmly associated with witches, cats, cauldrons, brooms, and the devil. Okay. So two things. One, okay. why is everyone so fucking mean to the cats? I don't know, but there's like a whole Netflix documentary called Don't Fuck With Cats. So apparently we don't put up with that shit anymore. Right. We don't <laughs> fuck with cats anymore. And then <laughs> my other thought is like, once again, there's this discussion about cats, but it's not specifically black cats. Right. It's just, I don't know. It bothers me. I don't know where the black cat thing came from. I don't know. I mean, because basically think... everything earlier was like not, they're all just stories. That's all right. it is. Right. I'm just looking for. You're looking for meaning where there's not any. <laughs> <laughs> where there's only superstition and people who don't, don't have science to explain anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're right. I just feel sad for the black cats. I know. Poor cats. Although, like, to be fair, I've known some cats who are real assholes in my life, so. (laughs) Fair. (laughs) All right. Uh, And then I thought it was interesting that I read that in America, this sort of, you know, modern association of Halloween with all things dark and death and gore and everything Uh, may have been influenced by the Civil War and the fact that um, during it, but also after it ended, you had huge numbers of people who just never came home. And, you know, people didn't get confirmation on whether or not they were dead. They just never came back. So it made sense in that time that people sort of like told a lot more Uh, ghost stories and ones that were especially ones that revolved around people sort of like coming back to you know their home or whatever because they were preoccupied with this idea that like their lost relatives you know might return or they wanted them to return (laughs) that's sad that's very sad (laughs) yeah (laughs) So, yeah, I only laugh because that's my coping mechanism. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Fake laughter hiding real tears. (laughs) Yes. 
<laughs> Always. <laughs> okay. Well, do you have any other thoughts about Halloween? I have a uh, I have a quote to end us on here. If you don't, uh, I do not. I think I think we've covered the major traditions and talked about the history of the holiday, and it was a good learning experience. No. Yeah. No, it was. Sorry. <laughs> It was a great learning experience. I learned a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, and now I get to excite I get everybody else excited with my vast Halloween knowledge. So yeah, boom. Now you're legit. One more, <laughs> one more reason to get my sweet Halloween tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. So I just I don't know why I wanted to end on this little quote here, but I read. Uh, an article by Maria Marzolo. And um, the, the title of the article is This is Halloween, The True Historical Origins and Meaning. And basically, I mean, she she kind of covers a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, um, but also covers that a lot of it is kind of, it comes from a lot of places and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense and um, that there's no real evidence that some of this stuff happened. So at the end, it's almost like an opinion piece where she talks about what her thoughts of what the meaning of Halloween is. Um, And at one point she says, the Halloween season is generally thought of as a spooky time of year because lurking beneath the surface of this otherwise fun holiday is the one aspect of life that all humans are conditioned to fear, death. And I just thought that was kind of heavy and spooky. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, although I think I had heard that listening to not that specific quote but yeah that idea listening to um the folklore podcast one of their halloween special episodes and yeah this idea that like zombies and all this stuff is like because people are less religious it's definitely related to sort of us confronting the idea yeah confronting it die and like what's gonna happen to us afterwards and stuff Right, so. and giving us a way to like make it fun right. and not just yeah, sad just, and terrible. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Before we wrap up, I wanted to put out one last reminder to please send us some spooky stories to our Spooky Science Sisters email or social media pages and keep listening to see if you hear your story make an appearance around Halloween. Also, we've moved our final segment to the very end of each episode. So if you want to listen to this week's Short and Spooky, stay tuned after our wrap up. So that wraps up episode 13 on Halloween traditions. Tune in next time for our special Spooky Listener Stories episode. If you like this episode, hit subscribe and share with a friend. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Spooky SciPod, Facebook at Spooky Science Sisters, and at our website, SpookySciencesisters.com. If you have any questions about previous topics or ideas for future episodes, email us at SpookySciencesisters at gmail.com. It's time for Short and Spooky. Yay! So I did this week's Short and Spooky. And um, I did it based on a TikTok video that I saw. (laughs) So you're motherfucking right that I picked it based on a TikTok (laughs) video. Um, But... Okay, there's this really awesome account, and basically all she does, well, she does some some art stuff sometimes, but her, the the main theme of her account, uh, and this is someone, her account name is Geodesaurus, and she does all of her TikTok videos on facts about lakes. So she's done a lot about the Great Lakes because I think she lives somewhere around the Great Lakes in the Midwest. Uh, But for the month of October, she's been doing a Spooky Lakes series, which I absolutely love. And I've like learned so many things about various spooky lakes. But one that I really liked um, because it has some, I guess, sort of modern, not modern, but very recent um, scientific discoveries that have honestly just made it more of a mystery uh, is one called Rupkund Lake, uh, which is a glacial lake in India, and it is sometimes called Skeleton Lake. 
like just a hundred percent perfect man. yeah for halloween so this lake is located in the indian himalayas it is at uh, just around sixteen thousand five hundred feet above sea level so it is up there <laughs> <laughs> for reference uh i think the highest peak in the continental u.s is like a little over 14,000. So, so it's, it's high. It's really high. <laughs> um, it is a three day hike from the nearest village. So it's, it's like a very remote, significantly like it's high altitude place. Um, some of the scientists in, or one of the scientists in the articles I read about it, like said that she basically just had altitude sickness the whole time that they were there and like couldn't even <laughs> hike up to the lake. So it's frozen for a lot of the year, but when the surface of the lake thaws, you can actually see hundreds of skeletons that are like on the bottom and around the lake. And like some of them, they're so well preserved because it's very cold <clears throat> and dry. Some of them still have skin attached and like pieces of clothing attached to them. The pictures are like super awesome. Um, Rupkund is spelled, it's two words, R-O-O-P and then K-U-N-D. But like just do a Google image search because they're it's really cool. So originally, it was proposed that all of these people died at the same time in like some single catastrophic event that occurred uh, around a thousand years ago. And one of the, I guess, popular interpretations based on uh, injuries that they observed in some of the skeletons were that there was like some sort of like freak violent hailstorm that, you know, this, these people were traveling or, you know, they were all together up in the mountains and they got caught in it and, you know, they died. And now, <laughs> now they're in this lake. Um, but there was some relatively new genetic analysis that was done, and it is, you can read about it in a paper that was published, I think, in Nature last year, so in 2019. So it shows that the dumping of the bodies in this lake was done over a period of about a thousand years. So most of the skeletons, so they, they did an analysis of 38 skeletons and like I saw that there were um there's like over 300 skeletons up there so over 300 people up there so most of them died around a thousand years ago but some of them were they did radiocarbon dating and they died as early or as recently as the early 1800s so it's like a huge amount of time <laughs> that is <laughs> that, amazing i mean terrifying i'm sure right like it's like the weirdest thing because it's like just ju like the time like that's totally different like cultures and everything and so not only do you have these skeletons from like this very wide time range but you they also showed that they had variable genetic makeups so some of the skeletons uh, have genetic makeups that are more similar to like Mediterranean heritage, so like modern day Greece, uh, instead of what they should be, which is like South Asian. There's also a third distinct group from Southeastern Asian, uh, Southeastern Asia. So it's like it's just the weirdest place because like they don't they don't really know like why why is there a thousand years of bodies in this lake from like wildly different parts of the world um and this study was done on just a subsect of 38 of these you know 200 to 300 plus skeletons so it's like who knows how many other geographic areas or you know, time periods are represented right. um, in the skeletons that are there. That is 
really cool. I, I, don't know, I don't know if cool is the right word, but. Yeah. It's like simultaneously very creepy, but like also awesome. super cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's a difficult site for anthropologists to interpret because, uh, you know, people do go up there to hike like recreationally. And so it's been disturbed by hikers over time. Um, there have obviously been like landslides and avalanches that have damaged the skeletons or moved them around. So it's sort of hard to tell, you know, exactly how they died or exactly how they all got there. So, you know, some people have thought, well, maybe it's just like, these are all people who died because, you know, it's high altitude, there's pretty dangerous weather patterns that can happen. And it is near kind of areas that they areas where they had known migration paths or places where people would travel when they were on pilgrimages. So potentially like it's just sort of people died while they were out on that or groups of people died while they were trying to migrate and then avalanches or landslides or whatever just like collect all the bodies and all the skeletons into the lake. But I think other anthropologists like that's one interpretation but a lot of anthropologists think that it's just such a large concentration of skeletons right and so it's like unlikely that they weren't put there on purpose like that yeah that like that yeah, that they weren't. Yeah, that like somebody was putting them there. Like somebody was putting them there. Like how convenient that that many bodies right. end yeah, up in the same spot. Yeah, they all just spot. like happen to end up there. Right. Um. So it's like they they just said like if you find that many bodies, that many skeletons, like it's probably a graveyard. But they like don't know why or who was putting them there or <laughs> what exactly happened to all of them. So it is like just the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that is really cool. Great short yeah. and spooky. Yeah. See, thank you, TikTok. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's short and spooky. So we will see you guys next time for Halloween listener stories. Thanks oh, for listening. Man. And stay, stay spooky. spooky. <laughs> This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.